Welcome to week 12. Previously on Administrative Law, we looked more closely at the APA's two procedural models. The APA prescribes Sections 556-557 procedures only if some statute requires the agency to make its decision on the record of a hearing. This applies both to rulemaking and to adjudication. This does not preclude other possible sources of procedural rights, for example, due process, statutory hybrids, or an agency's own procedural rules. APA Section 553 requires a notice of proposed rulemaking adequate to give the public an opportunity to comment. An agency may either state a proposed rule or describe the subject of a possible rule and issues to be addressed in formulating it. Notice is legally inadequate unless a final rule is a logical outgrowth of the initial notice. Adequate notice of a proposed rulemaking must disclose the evidence already in the agency's possession on which it intends to rely. A final rule's concise general statement of basis and purpose is inadequate if it does not respond to comments of major significance. Ex parte contacts are not allowed where notice and comment rulemaking merely determines competing private claims to a valuable privilege. If an agency closes the comment period prior to promulgating a final rule, it may not rely on late filed comments. Agencies normally allow a minimum 60-day comment period. Cases like HBO v. FCC and Sierra Club v. Castle in the D.C. Circuit introduced a degree of uncertainty about the boundary between the two APA procedural models. The U.S. Supreme Court took note in the case of Vermont Yankee Nuclear Power versus Natural Resources Defense Council. Vermont Yankee was a case that involved two actions by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC. One was the issuance of a license to operate a nuclear power plant in Vermont. The other was a rulemaking which standardized the consideration of the environmental impact of operating nuclear power plants. Our focus is the rulemaking. It is useful to consider some of the background to the case. Ever since the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, the destructive potential of nuclear devices has been well known. The American public has been skeptical about the possibility of safe, peaceful applications of nuclear energy. To promote peacetime development of nuclear energy, Congress in 1946 created the Atomic Energy Commission, the AEC. In 1975, the AEC was dissolved and most of its powers and mission were assigned to the NRC, its successor agency. One of the challenges the AEC and the NEC have continu excuse me, the NRC have continually faced is the fear that any use of nuclear energy must have dreadful and incalculable negative consequences. The benefits of using nuclear energy instead of burning fossil fuels to generate electricity are considerable, however. Nuclear power plants are not significant sources of CO2 and other greenhouse gases that contribute to global warming and climate change. Nonetheless, nuclear power plants do produce unique kinds of hazardous waste in the form of spent fuel. The high-level waste that is generated by nuclear power plants like Vermont Yankee has to be disposed of safely. It is highly toxic and can remain so for decades and in certain instances even millennia. Most spent fuel waste is stored on site in pools of water that moderate the radiation it emits as it further decays. The eerie blue glow seen in the pool pictured here is caused by ionization of the water. For several reasons, it is important to store high-level nuclear waste off-site rather than to keep it on-site. The question is, 
where? The NRC staff considered various possible sites for safe storage of spent fuel. Some were outlandish, that is, off earthish. earthish. Others were impossible to secure against terrorist interference. The best bet seemed to be burial deep within the ground in salt beds. After compiling a study it called the Environmental Survey, the NRC published a notice of proposed rulemaking. The notice described two alternatives for standardizing the cost of the, environment, the environmental cost of storing nuclear waste. One alternative would have assigned a zero cost justified by the NRC's staff that the cost assignable to any particular nuclear power plant was too small to meaningfully quantify. The other alternative assigned a small but non-zero cost. At the conclusion of the notice and comment proceedings, supplemented by a two-day hearing at which oral testimony was taken, the NRC promulgated the small but non-zero cost alternative. In the concise general statement accompanying the final rule, the NRC set out the assumptions underlying its decision. One assumption was that a suitable storage area exists in the continental United States. Another assumption was that once buried, there would be no release of radioactivity from the waste repository. Pictured above is Yucca Mountain, Nevada, which is still under consideration as a possible site. But at the time, the NRC granted the Vermont Yankee license, and as yet, there is still no such site, no such facility, and no budgetary authorization to build one. The two NRC actions and the rulemaking and the Vermont Yankee licensing occurred simultaneously. The NRC chose not to apply the new rule retroactively to the Vermont Yankee application, but granted it anyway. The Natural Resources Defense Council, the NRDC, appealed the two actions to the D.C. Circuit. The NRDC objected in particular to the fact that the NRC's expert, who had developed the proposed rule and the environmental survey, had not been available for cross-examination in the rulemaking process. The NRDC succeeded in persuading the D.C. Circuit panel that the NRC rule acted, the NRC in, form, in promulgating the rule acted arbitrarily and capriciously in issuing the rule on the record before it. The expert in question was Dr. Frank Pittman. Because the rule would standardize the evaluation of environmental costs in all future licensing proceedings, the NRDC argued that it was essential that the whole record for review of the rule include his sworn testimony and responses to cross-examination. The NRDC lawyers, no doubt, were kept awake at night thinking of the tough questions they could put to Dr. Pittman to discredit the factual basis of the rule. This is what every litigator lives for. The D.C. Circuit remanded to the NRC to develop the rulemaking record further, either by presenting Dr. Pittman for cross-examination or in some other way. Understandably, the NRC chose to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court rather than simp simply offer up Dr. Pittman. The Supreme Court reversed. It read the D.C. Circuit opinion as, in effect, setting aside the rule on grounds of procedural deficiency rather than substantive arbitrariness or capriciousness. But the NRC had followed sections fi Section 553 to the letter, and beyond that had even gratuitously agreed to hear oral presentations. The court wrote, Generally speaking, this section, Section 553, established the maximum procedural requirements which Congress was willing to have the courts impose upon agencies in conducting rulemaking. Agencies are free to grant additional procedural rights in the exercise of their discretion, but reviewing courts are generally not free to impose them if the agencies have not chosen to grant them. As if to chastise the D.C. Circuit for not having seen this coming, Chief Justice Rehnquist adds, We have cautioned reviewing courts against engrafting their own notions of proper procedures upon agencies. Engrafting is a botanical term which the court uses to disapprove the creation of judicial hybrid rulemaking procedures. Congress can, the agencies can, courts shouldn't. <laughs> 
the court sees the D.C. Circuit as, in effect, trying to nudge the agency in the direction of a hybridized rulemaking procedure. Lest the court seem to have shut the door completely, the opinion adds that this is not to say necessarily that there are no circumstances that would ever justify a court in overturning agency action because of a failure to employ procedures beyond those required by the statute. But such circumstances, if they exist, are extremely rare. How rare? The court does not even drop a footnote to alert us to what might count as an exceptional circumstance. Its discussion could be read as lending support to the Sangamon Valley Doctrine, seen through the prism of Londoner versus Denver, and it adds, without citing a Cardi or Arizona Grocery, that a totally unjustified departure from well-settled agency procedures of long standing might require judicial correction, but that was not so in this case. The opinion is clear that NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, does not create an exception. The implication is that the Vermont Yankee decision has the effect of practically erasing one of the possible sources of procedural constraint from our chalkboard. But we have to be careful not to overstate. As even our casebook editors seem to do, where they begin a conditional sentence this way. If Vermont Yankee prohibits viewing courts from interpreting Section 553 in an expansionary way, well, does Vermont Yankee prohibit reviewing courts from interpreting Section 553 in an expansionary way? The D.C. Circuit has not thought so. In the American Radio League case, it distinguished Vermont Yankee in these terms. The Supreme Court has limited the extent that a court may order additional agency procedures, but the procedures invalidated in Vermont Yankee were not anchored to any statutory provision. Anchors can be fixed to the end of some pretty long chains. Portland Cement and Nova Scotia Food at least purport to be interpreting APA Section 553, namely the notice requirement and the concise general statement requirement. So far, the Supreme Court has not addressed the correctness of this reading. The Supreme Court only hears about 80 cases a year recently out of about 7,000 petitions. And the 13 federal circuits decide many times that number of administrative agency reviews annually. But the Supreme Court's personnel changes. The most recent addition to the court, Brett Kavanaugh, had this to say, concurring in the American Radio League panel's application of Portland Cement, solely on the ground that it was circuit precedent. The Portland Cement Doctrine cannot be squared with the text of Section 553 of the APA. And Portland Cement's lack of roots in the statutory text creates a serious jurisprudential problem because Vermont Yankee rejected this kind of free-form interpretation of the APA. As Justice Kavanaugh, he might be on the lookout for cases of free-form interpretation of the APA to set straight. In the meantime, let's not give up on Nova Scotia food and Portland cement just yet, nor on the doctrines that could be disparaged as judge-made. We just don't want to call them judge-made. Call it fundamental fairness if it helps. It isn't stylish, but we have to know when to wear and when not to wear both belt and suspenders in the courtroom. <laughs>